many people have been taught that radiometric dating methods are an absolute way to date things. But exactly how solid are those dates? Radiometric backflips today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now our topic this week is radiometric backflips. How solid are these dates really? That's an interesting topic. Now a popular myth is that radioactive dating methods confirm the geologic time scale and the concept of human evolution. The methods uh, appear so impressive that many Christians accept them as evidence that the earth is very old. Uh, we're going to expose this myth today by doing a study of the dating of the East African KBS tuff strata and the famous fossil 1470, K-N-M-E-R 1470. That stands for Kenyan National Museum, East Rudolph. Now you'll have to follow along carefully here to see all the evolutionary assumptions, but you'll, you'll get them. Just, just uh, pay close attention. Right. Uh, Richard Leakey, son of famed uh, paleoanthropologist uh, Louis and Mary Leakey, visited the fossil deposits east of Lake Rudolph, which is now Lake Turkana, in northern Kenya in 1967. He immediately organized an expedition to search for hominid fossils. That's what his family okay. does. <laughs> and uh, the most important fossil discovered there is K&M ER 1470. Skull 1470 is modern in appearance, but was originally estimated by Richard Leakey to be about 2.9 million years old. Okay. One early geologist with Richard Leakey at East Rudolph was Kay Berensmeyer. Seeking to unravel the geology of the area, she discovered a volcanic layer of ash, or tuff, that became known as the Kay Berensmeyer site, the KBS tuff. Mm. If the KBS tuff were, were anywhere else, no one would give it, a, give it a second thought. However, at East Rudolph, it is of, of utmost importance. First, human fossils and, and artifacts, tools, cannot usually be dated radiometrically, but they can be at the KBS tuff. It contains radioactive uh, potassium-40, which decays into argon-40. Second, artifacts have been found in association with the KBS tuff. Right. So, so, so the, the assumption is that uh, the tuff gives an, an estimate of the age of the stone tools right. found there, right? Yep. So third, hundreds of Homo and Australopithecine fossils have been found above and below the KBS tuff. So the date of the tuff becomes uh, a maximum age for fossils found above it and a minimum for fossils uh, below it. Now the first attempt to date the KBS tuff was in 1969, well before the discovery of the skull, 1470. Right. Richard Leakey supplied rock samples to F.J. Fitch from uh, Birkbeck College and University of London and J.A. Miller from Cambridge University, both recognized authorities in potassium argon dating. Now Fitch and Miller's first analysis gave an evolutionary uh, gave evolutionary dates from 212 to 230 million years of age. Oh and dear. Concerning this, they said, from these results, it was clear that an extraneous argon age discrepancy was present. Well, wait a sec. I thought you tossed this stuff in a machine and whatever it came out to be, that's what the, what the date was. How, how did they know there was a problem? Well, the associated fossils told them that there was a problem. So, in spite of uh, our being assured that dating methods constitute independent confirmation of evolutionary dates, associated fossils had already determined the acceptable date ranges and the dates fell outside of those ranges and, and, and because of that they were considered wrong. Right. Now, based on their alleged evolution, the Australopithecine and other mammalian fossils found beneath the KBS tuff had determined that the rocks should be <laughs> between two and five million years old. So dates of 212 to 230 million years right. were, were way off. Without the associated fossils, however, there would be no way for an, an, an evolutionary geologist to know if the dates were good dates or bad dates. Uh, big problem here. Yeah. Uh, under other circumstances and without fossils to guide them, evolutionary geologists could have accepted those dates as good. Right, they would have been fact, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Fitch and Miller requested uh, new samples 
From these, they concluded from pumice lumps and, and feldspar crystals that the age of the KBS tuff was 2.61 million years. Wow. Uh, it, it was because Leakey found skull 1470 below this tuff after it had been dated at 2.61 million years and above rock dated at 3.18 million years that he estimated that the skull was then 2.9 million years old. So, so okay. you can see how evolutionary assumptions can overrule so-called absolute dating methods. Yeah, that one's easy to see. That one's very easy to see. We're going to show you some more examples of that, but people need to get out of their head that, oh, well, the scientists said it, it must be fact. And more when we come back. Many of the biggest dinosaurs, such as some of the long-necked sauropods like Brachiosaurus, Titanosaurus, and Apatosaurus, would have eaten colossal amounts of vegetation. So why do we find such a conspicuous absence of plants in rocks containing dinosaur fossils? Take, for example, the Morrison Formation in Montana, USA. Even though this formation has yielded many dinosaur fossils, there is a startling scarcity of vegetation preserved. This phenomenon of missing vegetation doesn't just apply to dinosaurs. The Coconino Sandstone in the Grand Canyon has many animal trackways, but it is almost devoid of plants. These rocks tell us something profound about Earth history. They suggest that these deposits are not ecosystems buried over eons of time. Otherwise, we'd find more evidence of the plants that the animals ate. Instead, the evidence fits nicely with the biblical model of Earth history, whereby these animals were transported and buried catastrophically during Noah's flood. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So if you just tuned in, uh, today we're talking about radiometric backflips. Yes. How solid are those dates, those dates that we read about that are supposed to be absolute dating methods. Uh, we're following a study done by uh, evolutionists trying to determine the age of a certain supposed ape man ancestor of ours. So let's continue there. Right. In 1972, before Skull 1470 was announced, uh, Vincent Maglio from Princeton University published in Nature a chronology of the hominid bearing sediments east of Lake Rudolph which included the KBS tuff that we've been talking about here. His work was based on the lineages of two species of pig and one of elephant. Now, Maglio's dates were uh, compatible with the radiometric date arrived at by Fitch and Miller of, of two to five million years old, something like that, and were considered to confirm their date. In 1974, a third chronology of the area was published in Nature based on paleomagnetism. The conclusion was 2.7 to 3 million years old. And, and it, that seemed to represent a bullseye for the correlation of various dating methods. So here's a bit more information. Right. So by late 1974, the KBS tuff had been dated five different times by four different dating methods. The alleged uh, compatibility of the different methods would seem to be like a geologist's dream, right? However, right. under the surface, Skull 1470, with its estimated age of 2.9 million years, uh, presented the, the evolutionary world with an intolerable situation here. Right. The theory of human evolution did not allow for a skull so modern to be that old. <laughs> Nevertheless, Richard Leakey continued to fight for his original date. If Skull 1470 was 2.9 million years old, then he had discovered the oldest member of the genus Homo. Uh, if it wasn't, he hadn't. Right. Hence, he resisted lowering the age of the skull. Right, he wanted the kudos for... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, meanwhile, another study by G.H. Curtis and his associates from the University of California, Berkeley, claimed to distinguish two um, tough units. One gave an age of 1.6 million years, and the other, where Skull 1470 uh, had, was found, gave 1.82 million years, both considerably younger than the five previous studies <laughs> had reported. Right. Okay, all of the... The previously cited article spoke of the great difficulty in getting rock or crystal samples that were not altered, weathered, or derived from older rock. The question arise, uh, the, the, the question comes up here: How does one know when one has good samples for dating? Well, the answer seems to be that good samples give dates in accordance with <laughs> evolutionary presuppositions. Bad samples give dates not in conformity with evolution. This is the classic case of circular reasoning here. This is what we're talking about. Of course. On March 20th, 1980, two more dating studies in Nature criticized the earlier work and claimed that the age of the KBS tuff was 1.87 or 1.89 million years. Then, in late 1981, Ian McDougall published his study of the KBS tuff, giving a date of 1.88 million years. At that point, the 10-year controversy over the date of the KBS tuff 
came to a close <laughs> with agreement on the more recent date. Okay. Although the dating of the KBS Tough appeared to have been settled in 1980 and 81, by conformity of different dating methods, the controversy was actually settled in 1975 by the pigs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Donald Johansson tells of attending the 1975 Bishop Conference on Anthropology and Geology in London. A major paper was presented by Basil Cook from Dalhousie University in Halifax, who'd studied the pig sequences in southern Ethiopia, at Hadar in Ethiopia, and at uh, Olduvai in, uh, Gorge in Tanzania. According to Cook, the dating at Lake Turkana, formerly Lake Rudolph, was too high by about 800,000 years. The pigs at Turkana told him so. <laughs> okay. Uh, Donald Johansson is the paleoanthropologist made famous for discovering Lucy, in mm -hmm. case you don't know that name. Uh, he wrote uh, of this conference, he said this, Nearly everyone but the Lake Turkana team, that would be Richard Leakey and his associates, went away convinced that the KBS Tough and Skull 1470 dates would have to be corrected. Right. Not <laughs> leaky, though, because he wanted... But, yeah. Right. Not leaky. So. But the astounding thing about the whole affair was that the anthropologists were rejecting the same objective scientific data that they universally appealed to. Yeah. There, there was yeah. internal consistency within the studies and high conformity by five different dating techniques. The main thing the dates did not conform to was the concept of evolution of pigs and humans not their own system. So we'll be back and talk more about this in a moment. Creation Ministries International focuses on the Bible's first book, Genesis, and the creation evolution issue. Many of our speakers are scientists with PhDs who, before joining CMI, were employed in various scientific fields. Creation Ministries speakers go to churches, equipping and encouraging people with the message of the truth and authority of the Bible and its relevance to the real world. To locate upcoming CMI events or inquire about booking a speaker into your church, visit creation.com. On this week's episode, we're talking about radiometric backflips, mm. and we've been seeing how radiometric dating methods are not really considered absolute at all by informed scientists. Right, I mean, in this case, <laughs> the evolution of the pigs is said to be the clear-cut answer to the dating problems that we've been looking at in East Africa. Right. But the evidence is less than impressive. In his uh, phylogeny <laughs> of the pigs, the bush pig, the forest hog, the warthog, etc., Basil Cook presented family trees for uh, three taxonomic groups. Two of the groups have at their bases the, the phrase hypothetical sus-like ancestor. Right? Okay. Uh, the 20 species that make up these three groups are shown in parallel lines connected only by dotted lines, indicating that there's no known relationship between any of the species. The chart could just as well have been written by a creationist, <laughs> drawn by a creationist. Yeah, most Amazing. Of, most of the fossil pig evidence consists of teeth. Several species are based on the skimpiest evidence, uh, imperfectly known, rare, scarce. These are the terms commonly associated with the fossils. And the various relationships between the different ones are largely guesses. So the 1980 and 1981 studies on the date of the KBS Tuff contain, contain so many criticisms of all the earlier studies that they called into question the objectivity and the valid, uh, validity of the dating methods themselves. Right. The, 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 this, this account highlights two major fallacies of radioactive dating. First, the history of the dating of the KBS Tuff reveals that no matter how careful a scientist is in selecting his rock samples and performing his laboratory work, if he gets the wrong date for his rocks, mm -hmm. he's open to the charge of using contaminated material and defective methodology and, and, and things like this. Well, yeah, but the, the charges need to be proved here, right? The, the literature set be suggests... Good that even if radiometric dating were, which was valid in concept, which, it, which it's not, but the practical matter of selecting rock samples that can be proved pure and uncontaminated, well, it requires an omniscience <laughs> beyond humans. It does, yeah. right? the, the radioactive dating methods are, are a classical example of circular reasoning. It, it's another one of these myths of that evolution that people just believe because they've been told, oh, they're absolute dating methods. Right. And secondly, what normally happens in a fossil discovery is that the fossils are discovered first, then attempts are made to date the rock strata in which they're found. Now, under these conditions, a paleoanthropologist has a degree of control over the results. He's free to reject dates that don't fit with the evolutionary scenario of the fossils. He's not even required to publish 
uh, those those obviously anonymous uh, discordant uh, dates. Right? Discordant dates. Uh, the results. Uh, the, the result is a very misleading picture of the conformity of the human fossil record with the concept of human evolution. Right. That's what you get. It's entirely possible that if this Skull 1470 had never been found, that, that uh, the KBS Tuff would be still dated at 2.61 million years. Yeah. We'd continue to be told that it was a secure date based on the precision of radiometric dating and independent confirmation of these other dating techniques that, that acted as controls, etc. All this scientific jargon, right? It was the shocking discovery of the morphologically modern skull 1470 located well below the KBS Tuff that precipitated this 10-year controversy. Backflips. Yes. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so in minds. this controversy over the dating of one of the most important human fossil discoveries, <laughs> d discoveries ever, the f human fossils, the, the pigs won. <laughs> the pigs won over the elephants. The pigs won over potassium argon dating. Uh, the, the pigs won over argon uh, 40, argon 39 dating, over fishing track dating. They won over paleomagnetism. The pigs won over all of these supposed absolute dating methods. Because they figured they, that this evolutionary trajectory of these pigs is the most solid. Right? Yeah, interesting. So one of the reasons CMI, uh, CMI makes so many resources available to people you know, who have an open mind to look at these uh, things is that these anomalies are rarely talked about in, in popular right. literature yeah. and, and teaching materials so that the average uh, person, they're not really exposed to this information. They just get told the final story, so to speak. Right. Um, and that's why so many people feel confident with these evolutionary dates they hear because they just hear them as absolutely scientific. Well, and, and, and everybody's in agreement, this, this type of thing. Yes, right? yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we see this so many times when we're out speaking, uh, people are looking at you like you're uh, living in some kind of conspiracy theory. What yeah. do you mean the young earth and so on? And often scientists have confidence in pronouncements made in other scientific disciplines where they have no expertise, not realizing the immense bias that is affecting the results that they read. And we'll say more about this when we get back. Carbon-14 is an unstable form of carbon that decays into nitrogen-14 at a measured rate, and this forms the basis of carbon-14 dating. In 2003, a group of researchers performed an unusual test on 10 coal samples obtained from Pennsylvania State University. The researchers wanted to see if carbon-14 could be detected in the coal samples. This test might be considered unusual because carbon-14 decays relatively fast and should not be detectable after a maximum of 90,000 years. Yet the coal samples tested came from strata allegedly ranging in the age from 37 million to 318 million years. The laboratory tests were clear. All of the 10 coal samples contained carbon-14 and similar amounts. This seriously undermines the evolutionary dates for the rock strata containing the coal, because the presence of carbon-14 affirms that the coal samples cannot be millions of years old. The results fit nicely with the coal forming from vegetation that was buried in Noah's flood. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Our subject today is radiometric backflips. How solid are those dates that we hear about in the scientific literature? Let's, get, let's continue now with another example of radiometric dating methods that are often taught to be absolute fact, which are in fact not at all. Okay, all right. In western New South Wales, that's in Australia, uh, part of a, a semi-arid desert has been set aside as a World Heritage Site. Evolutionists believe that the site represents an outstanding example of the major stages, one of the major stages in man's evolutionary history. It all centers on the discovery of human remains in sand dunes surrounding ancient Lake Mungo. Right. And the first major find um, in 1969 was uh, of a crushed and burnt uh, skeletal fragments interpreted to be a, a female called Lake Mungo One, or more affectionately, Mungo Woman. Mungo Woman, there we <laughs> yeah. go. What made the find significant was the assigned date. Carbon-14 dating uh, um, yielded an age of 19,000 years and on collagen, some soft tissue, uh, gave a 24,700 year uh, age. This excited the archaeologists because these dates made their find the oldest human burial in Australia. Okay, but carbon-14 dating on nearby charcoal produced an age up to 26,000 years, 26,500 years. This meant that the skeleton uh, buried slightly lower than the charcoal, must have been older 
Not surprisingly, the older charcoal age was considered to be the most reliable estimate <laughs> and launched uh, Mungo women uh, to uh, national and international fame because right. of this, this old age. It's even older. Yeah. So uh, Jane Baum of the Center for Archaeology at the University of uh, Western Australia put it succinctly. She said, there's a general perception that there is a competition to get the oldest date and there's kudos in it. <laughs> Whoever gets the oldest one wins. Absolutely. Uh, th there was a kudos in this date. At 26,000 years, Mungo Woman was nearly twice as old as the previous oldest date for Aboriginal settlement in Australia, and possibly the earliest human cremation in the entire world. So. Right. So then in 1974, um, Bowler and Thorne, uh, two researchers, found a, a skeleton sprinkled with, the, uh, with powdered red ochre in, uh, in a grave only 450 meters away. This one was well uh, preserved and similar to the skeletons of modern Aborigines because uh, the new skeleton, uh, Lake Mungo III, they called it, was, was found in the same sand bed, technically the st same uh, stratigraphic horizon. Uh, he was assigned the same age as Mungo Woman. Um, thus, Mungo right. Man became famous, uh, too, uh, as one of the world's earliest uh, burial sites. Okay. Right? Uh, the situation became even more exciting when a different dating method, uh, thermal luminescence, was used. In 1998, Bowler reported that sand from the, uh, the Mungo III site gave an age of some 42,000 years. Wow. Uh, being older than the carbon-14 dates, Mungo Man acquired a new stature, a new status, on the world evolution scene. Yep. So the earlier reliable carbon-14 ages were abandoned in favor of the thermoluminescence dates. So which one was so, fact? <laughs> which one was well, science? That's the thing, right? Which one was, you know, truth? <laughs> so then in 1999, other scientists from uh, the Australian National University published a new comprehensive study on the age of Mungo Man. They used different samples of bone and sand and, and, and a couple of different dating methods. And the results from all the different methods agreed closely. Their conclusion? Mungo Man was 62,000 years old. He's getting older uh, all the time. Getting older all the time. Just, yeah. there, there was just one small problem. The new date meant that the history of Australian occupation would have to be <laughs> rewritten. <laughs> and it also affected the ideas of, of, of human evolution in other parts of the world. Right. So, so, so Bowler stubbornly refused to accept the new dates in his protest of the Journal of Human Evolution. He said, for this complex laboratory-based dating to be successful, the data must be compatible with the external field, field evidence. It's hard not to laugh here, but in, in other words, you don't just accept the laboratory date without question. Yeah, that's the moral of the story. It, it's, it's not the last word on the age of something. You only accept the date if it agrees with what you already think it should be. Exactly. That's the moral and, of the story. And that's what we've been saying all along. <laughs> this is why we won't accept any data that contradicts the eyewitness evidence of human history recorded in the Bible. Right. It's the authority. Any of these contradictory dates simply can't be correct. Yeah, in short, the, the dates are wrong because they are based on wrong assumptions. For example, the carbon-14 method doesn't account for the disruption of carbon balance during the flood some 4,500 years ago. The uranium methods don't make correct assumptions about the initial conditions of the samples or about the effects of changing environmental, environmental conditions throughout time. The, the luminescence dates have the same problem. Um, it just goes on and on. Exactly. Um, Basically, what we're telling Christians here is this. Don't marry your theology to these scientific so-called dating methods, because once you do, uh, you're going to find out you might get a divorce sooner or later. And oftentimes, it's, we've seen people who've claimed Christianity reject their faith over these so-called scientific dating methods, right. but they aren't absolute. And we'll have more when we come back. The reason that the Creation Answers book is so popular is because it covers a huge range of topics and answers more than 60 of the most asked questions about Genesis and the creation evolution issue. Questions like, what is the evidence for God's existence? Could the days in Genesis 1 be long periods of time? How did all the animals fit on Noah's Ark? Does radioisotope dating prove that the Earth is very old? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And many more. To order your copy, visit creation.com. 
Welcome back. As we wrap things up here, we're going to talk about what's going on in the news. There's, some, there's always some interesting science, and uh, we got this from, from actually Fox News, the website, but there's, there's all stuff all over the place. Yeah, every week uh, I'll, I'll get on some of the news sites and just to, to see what's out there. Evolutionary yeah. stuff is constantly yeah. being portrayed. So this article uh, just came out a little while ago. Neanderthals wore eagle talons as jewelry 130,000 years ago. Now, many of you probably remember reading about Neanderthal or seeing depictions of Neanderthal. And of course, when they were first found, they were always depicted as these brutish, proto-human, yeah, subhuman. and, yeah. You know, uh, not as intelligent, of course, even in modern movies, you know, and Night at the Museum and stuff like that. They're all <laughs> the cavemen, right? right. And they're yeah, not okay. that smart, etc. Well, let me just read portions of this here. Long before they shared the landscape with modern humans, Neanderthals in Europe de developed a sharp sense of style, wearing eagle claws as jewelry, new evidence suggests. Researchers identified eight talons from white-tailed eagles, in including four that had distinct notches and cut marks from a 130,000-year-old Neanderthal cave in Croatia. They suspect the claws were once strung together as part of a necklace or bracelet. And of course, here's one of the researchers. It really is absolutely stunning, uh, study author David Freer, an anthropology professor at the University of Kansas, told Live Science. It fits with this general picture that's emerging that Neanderthals were much more modern in their behavior. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So we just finished talking about all of these articles and dating methods and all these fancy dates from radiometric dating in this case. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then a few years later, there's another study that overturns the, the previous study and, and, and actually starts just criticizing it and say, well, it was wrong and here's why it's wrong. And yeah. They did sloppy research and so on. And, and one of the things that CMI does, and I think we actually do it more effectively than the evolutionists uh, do, is see, we're constantly scanning for stuff like this. If you go right. to our website right now, you go to creation.com and you just pun punch in Neanderthal, you're probably going to get 20 or 30 articles come up, and you're going to get some, uh, some modern articles where, see, they haven't just found jewelry with Neanderthals. They found that they wore makeup. They found that right. they buried people in religious rituals. They found that they have uh, basically produced offspring with modern humans. Well, what does that make them? A, a human, right? <laughs> Not, exactly. some, not some, you know, proto-ape man or whatever like that. And they have all the characteristics of modern humans. They did cave right. art. They're talking about some of the cave art that Neanderthals produced, like the, the Sistine Ch Chapel of cave art. It's yeah. beautiful. It's wonderful. And so, you know, oftentimes people will see a scant article like this and they'll say, okay, well, this kind of fits in with the evolutionary story. But we take all the stuff, we package it together. What do we find? No, Neanderthals were just people uh, dispersed after right. the flood, yeah. right? And can we trust these dates now that this article is talking oh, about, right. given, yeah. given what we've just been talking about? Yeah. This kind of information, you can get a great sample of it. Get a free Creation Magazine digital copy at creation.com slash free mag. You can have a look at a digital copy there next week. Logic, Reason, and Christianity. We'll see you next week.